Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Uh, Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for how it helps us with our life, Lord. And we come to you now. We just pray that you would help us keep all of our distractions, help us lay them at your feet, Lord. You're the only one big enough to carry them anyway. And I uh, pray now that you'd use Pastor Izzy to encourage each one of us. Uh, give us this day what we need to be encouraged for this coming week. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Today is Communion Sunday, and uh, been saving this part for the part where we get to the, the teaching that Paul does on communion this morning. That'll be at the end of today's message. But before we get to that, last week we were going over who is the head of the church? Christ. And who's the head of Christ? God. And so the, last week we went over how there was this, this order that God has established. Christ, uh, God is at the top. Christ is below, and then the church comes under that. Now, this part of like a chain of command, if you're raised like I was in a military family, no trouble. This makes total sense to me. I mean, I, you know, chain of command, I can do like real good. But um, in, in my upbringing, because I was, uh, you know, exposed to every branch of the military, and I had a grandfather who was a four-star general at Lompoc Air Force Base, you learned that the chain of command works real good unless one link in the chain doesn't want to take orders from the link above it, you know, so to speak, or they, they just go, ah, forget it, I want to I be in charge. But does that work out good for the private that tries to take over with the general? No. Does it work out good for us as Christians when we try to take over Christ's job? You know, Christ is the head, and we're just the, the bo we're supposed to be the body of Christ. Where is the body supposed to get its orders from? The head. Whenever we switch the roles around and the body starts trying to tell the head what to do, you're going to have some problems. And that's what Paul has been pointing out. This, this order, this structure of God's authority is so important in our lives. And I don't, like for me, I was just sharing it and I was sharing, guys, this is how God made it. This is how he set it up. The, and there was a picture of Christ in his church. A living picture. What was the picture that I shared last week that we have as examples to this world? It's the, it's the relationship between what? A husband and a wife. There's husbands we saw last week and went through all the details that <laughs> our list is kind of big. We have to, we're commanded, not suggested, that we love our wives like Christ loves the church. And that we nourish them, we cherish them, we sanctify them, we take care of them, we present them without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I mean, there's, guys, first of all, I mean, you know, it was pointed out to me this week that I, I mentioned last week, and, and the girls part was one-liner. Girls, see to it that you respect your husband. Now, one of the girls pointed out to me, she said, well, yeah, but, y you know, um, if you have a good husband, that's not, like, if he's doing all those things, no problem. But um, the gal pointed out to me, she said, you know, the problem is we're not actually in our culture being told to look for the one you would actually respect. And I thought, well, that's never even thought of it that way because I'm always on the other side of the you know, equation. I'm just thinking about all the stuff I got to do to take care of my gal. And, and you know, that was a good point. I should, I should just share, this is just from one of the gals in church telling me her perspective is, you should point out to the gals, don't go for a guy if you're not, you, you're thinking, I like him, but I can't respect him. You know, there's something about I just don't respect. I mean, as the body of Christ, are we supposed to respect Christ, our head? Yeah. I mean, I, personally, I don't have any problem with that because I know how much Christ loves me and what he's done for me and mass respect. I mean, he, he deserves all respect for what he did for us. But gals, if you're picking a guy to spend your life with that's going to be your, your, your spouse, don't pick one you don't respect out of the gate. If you say, well, I can't respect him. I, I think he's hot, but I don't respect him. 
I hear this, by the way. Just, you think pastors are shielded or something. We don't know these things. I got news for you. There's a problem. We, we have to, you know, and guys, if, you, if you're looking at a gal and you're thinking, I, I think she's hot, but I don't want to have to nourish her and cherish her and sanctify her and present her, you know, no spot, no wrinkle, nor any such. I, I have to make her holy and blameless. If you think, I don't want to do that for that gal, then that's not the gal for you. Or else you need to grow up. I'm just saying, spiritually, you got to grow. We, we all grow into this, by the way. I don't think everyone starts off doing all these things perfect out of the gate. But we should at least aspire to. We should at least shoot for, you know, I, I don't go, hey, I just want to love my wife enough to get by. Wait, that is the dumbest attitude. You might as well get a revolver and just start blowing toes off. Boom, boom, boom. That would be less painful. Aim for doing it correctly. When you fall short a little, you'll have to live through the pains of that. But at least you'll be aiming high and, and, and you're going to get a better mark. Okay? Guys, we should not be settling. And gals, neither should you. Okay? Neither should you. Now, Paul's going to share some things. Now, Paul... For those of you that don't know about Paul, before he was called Paul the Apostle, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was, uh, in the Jewish faith, a very zealous guy. He was the one out killing Christians before the Lord converted him. But before he even got his letters from the, the, the chief priest to have permission to go lock up anyone that belonged to this new way, they called it, the Christian movement was called The Way, because Jesus said, I am The Way the truth, the life, no one gets to the Father except through me. So he said, you know, Paul got a letter that said, anyone who claims to belong to this way, I get to beat them. I get to lock them up. He was zealous. But who, he, who was he trained under? Some of you know this. Gamaliel, that's right. The, the, the prominent religious rabbi, really, really well known. Learned in the, in the Old Testament, we call it our Old Testament. They called it the Scriptures. Remember, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And Paul, when he was called Saul, was called a Pharisee of Pharisees. That is not a light title. To get the title Pharisee of Pharisees meant you knew the whole of the law. You could write the book of Isaiah from memory, every jot, every tittle, every little mark, every little punctuation mark, from memory. How many chapters we got in Isaiah? 66. A lot. Yeah, she goes, a lot. That's good. <laughs> a lot. It's referred to as the mini Bible. Of the Old Testament. You go, to, you go to Bible school, they'll teach you these things. It literally lays out from the fall of man to the redemption work of Christ all the way through the whole thing. The, the, the work of Isaiah is like a, an, uh, an, how do I, paraphrase, no, Reader's Digest of the entire Bible. All squeezed into one book. But it's not a little book. It's a, it's a big book. And he had to have it all up here. Write it out. You can pass your test for Pharisee of Pharisees. Write the book of Isaiah down. Don't miss one punctuation point. That's, this guy knew his stuff. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out to you is because he's going he's gonna to teach some stuff today that I think is really good for us to understand where he's coming from. He knows the law. He knows the Jewish faith. He knows their culture. And he's going to point out some things that when I read this chapter, I was like, Gosh, I got a lot of questions because I've been to Israel five times. I'm learning Hebrew. I don't have it anywhere. I'm a kindergartner in Hebrew compared to this guy. You know, I mean, he, he's totally fluent and knows it well. But here, I'm, I'm reading this thing, and I'm kind of erased. You ever read the Bible and get more questions than you get answers? This is how this chapter started for me. When I got to the part here that we pick up with today. Now, we saw last week, Paul said in verse 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of the woman. God is the head of Christ. And verse 4, every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying, what does Paul say that it does for him? It disgraces his head. Now, I'll tell you why this perplexed me right out of the gate. It was when the first time I went to Israel, we went to the Western Wall. They called it the Wailing Wall back then. It's the wall of Solomon's, the outer part of Solomon's temple that is exposed to this day, the foundation stones. 
don't think they're going to move them anytime soon. They're like 20 feet by 30 feet by 10 feet high. We don't even know how they moved them back then. Solomon, it said, had wisdom from God to do this. We don't even have cranes that can pick up the stones that he used in the foundation wall. They're, they're, they're massive. But they're sitting there exposed, and the people go up there, and they, they, you, you might have seen this where they're bobbing, you know, nodding, you know, bowing a little, and they're praying, and, and they have they, a requirement. Even Gentiles, if you want to go up and pray in this little courtyard area in front of the wailing wall, you have to put a little kippa, a little covering on your head. If you're a tourist, it's kind of gross. They have little paper ones. They're not really disposable. The people turn them back in to the basket as they leave, and then the next guy picks it up. I'm thinking, I don't know, head lice or something. This just, just seems like a bad idea. I went to the gift shop and bought a little Israeli one, you know, with, the, with Snoopy and the Israeli army symbol on it and put it on my head. And I, and I, greeted, I greeted the guy in Hebrew. And, uh, and my whole tour was like, where do we go, blah, 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 in English. And I just said, said, hello, good morning in Hebrew, how are you? And he just separated me from the group and let me go over to the, to, there's, a, there's a synagogue that goes along that wall. There's a little gate and let me go into the synagogue and get down, all the way down. And I got to talk to one of the rabbis inside and he brought me to the spot and he said, you're now standing the closest that you can possibly stand to the Holy of Holies without going through this. You'd have to go on the other side of this wall is where the Holy of Holies actually existed. That's all I, mean. I was like, super cool. But I still was confused. Why you got to put this thing on my head? Oh, it's tradition of the Jews. Because they believe that there's God above and they're below and that they're separated. Well, they, yeah, they don't, but they don't believe that. If, you, if they don't believe Christ is the Messiah... He's the one who tore the veil. He's the one who took away the separation. But see, to them, they're still, they still have a consciousness that there's a God above, men below, but they feel separated from Him. Christ came to fix the separation. You know, but they require that you put this thing on your head. I'm like, I ain't using one of them paper ones. I'll use mine, you know. Pulled it out, put it on, went in there, and I got to ask the rabbi questions. It was really interesting that Here's this kid from America asking questions, trying to learn Hebrew, and just that I wanted to know. Like, they were like, whoa. They, they spent hours with me in there. I was like, this is great. I mean, the rest of my group is stuck outside. They can't come in. And they don't know that it's just, it's so cool how the Lord opens those little divine appointments that you get to, you know, learn things and see things that will help mold and shape your faith. But it made me go, you know, these men think that this is such a holy place because this is as close to the Holy of Holies as they could get where the ark actually sat on the other side of this wall. And that's where the place, you know, inside the inner curtain, there only one priest got to go once a year into that place and they tied a rope around his ankle. Remember, and he had the bells down his leg. And what happened if the bells didn't keep chinging, you know, a little... They drugged him out as dead because the guy, if he brought in the offering and it didn't please God, he died. You're thinking, high priest job, not good. <laughs> Let me just be the candle lighter or something, you know. I was raised an altar boy. We lit candles. That was good. You know, you, you be the high priest, you're going to risk your life going in there giving the offering for the people. But see, Jesus became the high priest that gave his life for the people and then rose from the dead and tore the veil and said, no more separation, you don't need this anymore. And Paul is, Paul is pointing this out. Now, if anyone knew Jewish culture and Jewish tradition, we're talking to a guy schooled under the top of the top. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. You don't get the title Pharisee of Pharisees unless you have arrived at the top of the crop. <laughs> Christ, here's Paul, Pharisee of Pharisees, a rabbi. That, that's the title. Te Rabbi just means teacher, by the way. He's at the top of the game in the spiritual faith. He is considered a teacher. And he says that if you prophesy as a man, if you pray as a man with anything on your head, it's a disgrace. You disgrace your head. Now, why? He explains it. Let's just read out. This way, nobody said, accuse me, I made this up. I did not come up with this. Paul is explaining it. He says right here, he goes on, he says, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying, she disgraces her head, for she is one and the same with the woman 
who has her head shaved. Now, remember, in their culture, you had your sh head shaved as a woman. That was a, not considered, um, culturally, it was a disgrace. So, so he says, for if the woman who d does, does not cover her head, verse 6, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it's a disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off and, or her head shaved, then let her cover her head. So he's really kind of like saying, you need to cover your head. Not, I mean, in their culture, it's like he's given a loophole, but it doesn't really work, so it's cover your head. And then he explains why. He says, for the man ought not to have his head covered since he is in the image and the glory of God. But the woman who is, is in the glory of man. Remember, woman was made, we went over how Adam was put to sleep, rib taken, and woman was made from him. And so Paul points out, for indeed man was not created for women's sake, but women for man's sake. Now I got, I have no, tr not a single woman had trouble with this last week when I explained that men need help. I mean, sorry, women were created as a helpmate, which means what about men? We need help. They never argue this point. They all know it. <laughs> women were made for men's sake. It, the women go, amen, they need us. <laughs> and I pointed out last week, men, if you're so prideful that you will not accept help from your, from your bride, you're stupid. I'm sorry, but that, they were made to help you, and you saying, no, don't help me, is you're just being dumb. You're being too prideful. You, she, God designed her to help you. He, she sees stuff you don't even see. She knows things, and she's there to help you. Let her help you. Okay? Now, Paul says, therefore, a woman should ought to have a symbol of authority over her head. Because he, he, Paul says, because of the angels. Now, I don't fully understand this, but I trust him. He, he's the one that was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, however, in the Lord, neither is women independent of man, nor man independent of women. You know, once Christ came, there was a great elevation of women in the status of society. Before this, if you don't know this, you study, you study world history and, and look at, at the role of women in the Middle East where, where this was taking place. How were women treated back then? Like property, like, like slaves. Like, I mean, they were not. Paul is saying, look, women are not independent from men. Men are not independent from women. He says, for as the woman originates from the man, so also man has his birth through women. And all things originate from what? From God. Let's get this back to the point, you know. He's the boss. Now he says, judge for yourselves if it is proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? You know, this verse was quoted to me from my general, grandfather. Not a God-fearing man never went to church and somehow knew this Bible verse. It is a shame for a man to have long hair. Cut your hair, son. It's touching your ears. You think I'm joking? I'm not joking. They literally know Bible verses, these generals. I don't know how they know them. But they literally, my, my grandpa bear quoted this verse to me. It is a disgrace for a man to have long hair. Cut your hair. Don't know where I picked it up, but it is here in the Bible. Now, for a woman, it says, if, if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. So, I have a very glorious wife. Very long hair. And it says, for her hair is given as a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, Paul says, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. This is, what else can we do? Now remember, Paul is said, he's answering questions they wrote to him about. What do we do about this? What, you know, what about is, uh, if a man prophesies or a woman prophesies, do they, I, I'm pretty sure there was a question about this. They came to him. So he's given a really straightforward answer. Guys, don't put a covering on your head. Gals, you're supposed to put a covering on your head. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.